Hello and welcome to the AIM Summit webinar today on the future of wealth management, fintech, disruption and differentiation of players across the industry. I'm Zachary Sefrati, CEO and founder at Dalma Capital and strategic partner of AIM Summit. I'm so happy to be welcoming you with us today. We have so many people dialing into us from over 50 different countries. Amongst you are institutional investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, and leaders of the financial services industry from around the globe. Please feel free to submit your questions as they come throughout the entire session. There's a Zoom uh, Q&A dialogue at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on YouTube, please like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel now, and be sure to go to aimsummit.com so you can join the live sessions and be part of the Q&A. I'm so glad to be introducing our webinar partner today, uh, our, our favorite institution and a long relation of AIM Summit, which is Saxo Bank. Saxo Bank connects people in invest in, to investment opportunities in global capital markets. As a provider of multi-asset trading and investment, Saxo strives to empower people with user-friendly, seamless, and personalized platform experience that gives them exactly what they need when they need it, no matter if they're, they want to actively trade global markets or invest into their future. And I can certainly speak to our experience at Saxo Bank that they are on the money on all of those points. Um, I'm also so happy to be introducing a, a longtime friend, uh, the moderator, uh, Nicholas Wright from Saxo Bank. As an online industry, online trading industry veteran of the last 25 years, Nick is passionate about commercializing innovative and disruptive technology. Nicholas is responsible at Saxo Bank for building the white label partnerships. Um, and these collaborations are transforming banks and financial institutions across the region as they navigate the ever-changing market and regulatory systems. His current focus is providing financial institutions with BAAS or banking as a service, multi-asset ex execution, robo-advisory, digital channels, and prime brokerage. Prior to his time at Saxo Bank, Nicholas successfully launched and led cutting edge products, services, and platforms for major brands, including Bloomberg, Dresner, uh, Kleinwerts, Mubasher, and Beltone. Uh, introducing our speakers today, none other than Mark, Mark Chahuan. Mark is the co-founder of Sarwa, which in 2017 um, is uh, launched its platform and is the new generation uh, is a new generation firm with a new generation leadership. Uh, Mark has over 10 years of experience in diverse roles spanning strategy, management, operations, and technology. Mark has previously worked at organizations including Accenture Strategy, focusing on banking and wealth management, as well as Case de Depot, a placement de Quebec or C CDPQ, one of Canada's largest pension funds with over 270 billion of AUM. Uh, he started his, his career at Blom Invest Bank. Mark studied finance and entrepreneurship, earning his bachelor in commerce from McGill University and is has been recognized in the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Uh, an impressive profile to have with us today indeed. Um, also with us is Deepak Mera. Deepak has been the head of investments at Commercial Bank of Dubai since 2007. His career has spanned close to 30 years as he's worked in leader, leadership positions at organizations including Citibank, Credit Suisse, and Dubai Bank. He has an engineering degree from the in Indian Institute of Technology, which he earned in 1989, as well as an MBA from the Institution of Management Technology in 1991. Deepak is a regular speaker on Bloomberg TV and is the author of the bestseller, Ready, Steady, Go. Uh, also introducing uh, Th Thomas Shorstein. Um, Thomas Shorstein is a member of the executive board at, uh, at Additive AG based in Zurich. He's responsible for Additive's sales activities within the Middle East and Switzerland. Thomas joined Additive uh, from Credit Suisse AG three years ago, where he's managing director within their wealth management division. His positions held within Credit Suisse for the last 20 years have included market area, market group head, uh, and, uh, and he was the head of various posi positions for various markets across Germany, the Netherlands, Nordics, Israel, Africa, and Central and Eastern Europe. He's earned an MBA in banking and finance from the University of Zurich, uh, M-A-U-Z-H. Um, it's such a pleasure to introduce such a great panel on such an interesting topic. I can I can recognize why so many people have dialed in from around the world. Uh, without further ado, I, it's, I'd love to hand over to, to Nicholas Wright, who will be taking the discussion forward for a 40-minute fireside chat, after which we'll be opening up the Q&A. But again, remember, ask your questions anytime. We'll look at, to address them at the end of the session. Uh, Nicholas, over to you. 
Thank you, Zach, and uh, welcome to everybody. I thought I'd open with a little personal introduction before we get the panelists um, to share their opinions. Um, personally, over the past 25 years, um, I have seen technology, um, new market structure, new regulation continually change uh, and disrupt capital market trading. And that's both for institutions and individuals. Um, I think that's only uh, quickened in pace since the financial crisis, where we've seen changing regulation again, we've seen much improved scalable technology. And um, I kind of see the innovative passive asset, passive asset classes as um, all catalysts to moving across to the wealth management sector, uh, where we have seen services being provided at fractions of the cost of traditional services. Um, and we've noticed at Saxo Bank, post COVID, another leg up in demand for private investors and traders to benefit from volatility and take control of their investments in a digital way. I think uh, there's some statistics that are out now um, showing that robo services grew by five and a half times in the last three years, reaching 70, over 70 million investors in 2020. And that's expected to grow to 147 million by 2023. Um, and finally, the Middle East, you know, how does the Middle East fare in this revolu revolution? Well, I, it's obviously not uh, there where US and Europe and Asia are, but we are definitely seeing the roots, grassroots being laid in this region uh, for this wealth management revolution. So our topic, uh, the future of wealth management and the role of tech, I think is so relevant right now. Uh, and I'm truly excited to, to get going with the panelists. So I'd like to open up with Mark. Mark, uh, obviously, uh, being a robo advisor, being a fintech, being a startup, um, and the fact that this whole business is set to grow so significantly, um, you know, what do you see as the opportunity here in the region? And what would you say are the major challenges to you fulfilling those opportunities? Yeah, thanks for the great question, Nick, and the intro. I would say in terms of an opportunity, it's massive just given the how new all of uh, what we're discussing is. So th there's a lot of people that are establishing um, either brands or technology that's that's really, you know, in the US or in Europe, as you said, might be uh, late, but we're really catching up very quickly. So uh, the change is happening really fast. It's a very young population. Uh, that's been underserved for quite a long time, but they're more and more connected with um, with what's happening outside. They know what to expect in terms of fees, in terms of service. So I think the, the opportunity is massive in terms of whether you look at it from a dem demographic point of view uh, or, um, or from the ecosystem that is now uh, forging, which bring me to the challenges that are now becoming uh, softer, I would say, before. As a fintech, when we started in 2017, we felt like it was pretty lonely versus now uh, you have a lot of fintechs, you have uh, great firms like Saxo um, that are more actively collaborating with fintechs. Regulators have their own processes of regulating firms. So it's all coming together to, uh, to form great user experiences because it doesn't take just one. Um, it's, it's the no, conversation is no longer bank versus fintech versus it's all of them coming together to do that. So that's that was the main challenge for us in the region and that's quickly being addressed. Excellent. Um, Deepak, um, obviously as the head of wealth in a tr traditional bank, um, you know, how important is it for wealth management divisions at banks to automate, to move in the direction that we're seeing the fintechs uh, come? Um, do you need to? Um, do you need to kind of have a blended service? You know, what, what do you see the product being offered by banks to counter this fintech challenge? And where do you see banks being in five years time in wealth management? 
Yeah, I think that's a very good question, uh, Nick. And I think this is keeping us busy a lot for the last few years. So it's not new. I think this is something that we all saw it coming. It was there, it was happening, like Mark said, in the developed markets, and it's reached everywhere else. I think for us, the, uh, the directions are very clear. We cannot afford to stay where we are. We have to move towards uh, where our clients are moving. So one of the key things that we see is the changing demographics of our customer base, where uh, in the early parts of my career, I used to see wealth moving up from the younger population to the aging, um, you know, in America, they call them baby boomers, but yeah, this, the similar population world over. The last five to seven years, I'm seeing the average population, oh, sorry, the average age of our customer, the demographics becoming younger and younger. So as the wealth of the great wealth transfer happens, uh, brick and mortar banks have to align themselves to where and how their clients want to deal with them. So I think this is inevitable. And uh, we as banks have tremendous advantages. And I think if we play it well, uh, we can really um, retain our base and grow our, our businesses. And when we talk about fintechs, actually I see fintechs being great partners to, to large banks because there are tremendous advantages that we've got. To begin with, we've got huge customer base, a legacy customer base built over decades. Um, so it's a question of cross-selling to that base which is easier than acquiring a new base for a fintech company. Mm. The second big advantage that we have in banks is the availability of capital. So banks are very well capitalized. And if anything, post the crisis, not just this crisis, post the previous crisis as well, bank capitals and the capital base has become stronger. So we have the money to invest. We have the customer base. And very interestingly, I was looking at, at, a, at, a, at some uh, survey which was done by Bain's uh, consulting firm. And they said even the millennials trust the banks more than they would trust a non-banking financial institution. So I think the way I look at it going forward, banks have to partner with FinTech because we may have missed out on the FinTech run in the last 10 years post the previous financial crisis, but then for the reasons that I just mentioned, we can buy innovation faster than uh, what fintechs can do in terms of acquisition of their customer base. So since we can buy innovation, I think the model going forward is partnership with fintechs and that would benefit both the sides. But having said that, Nick, my, my concern is not fintechs because that I see as partners going forward. My concern is if big tech gets into uh, wealth, uh, big tech, because they, they have in, in the same study of Bain shows that even though banks are trusted most by millennials, they also trust companies like Amazon or Apple almost as much as they trust their bank. So the big risk is the big tech that getting into our business and, and then grabbing market share from the combination of banks plus fintechs, which I see getting into partnership at some stage. So this is how, how Nick, I'm looking at the world. So I'm looking at two big things, which is this fintech bank and big tech, this space, how this will evolve over the next five to 10 years. And the second big uh, driver would be the great wealth transfer that happens from this baby boomer and the equivalents around the world who made lots of money in their, in their prime to these generation Z, Gen Zs and the millennials uh, who are uh, tech natives uh, and very different in terms of how they would want to approach uh, businesses. So these, these are, this is how I'm looking at the world uh, so far, Nick. Deepak. I couldn't agree more and I wanted to come back to some of your points there because I think that is what everybody that's listening in wants to hear. You know, how is this space going to pan out? Is it going to be bank? Is it going to be fintech? And you brought the third and ever looming 
a partner there, which is the big tech. So I think um, this is an exciting, we'll drill down a little bit more in the, uh, after I've asked Thomas a question. And the other point you've raised, which I think is really interesting, is this route wealth transference. In fact, $68 trillion is supposed to be inherited over the next decade by millennials and Gen Y or whatever we're calling. So we'll come back to that. Great points. So Thomas, there's a clearly a, a technological revolution going on. Um, new players, incumbents, you know, it's it's all up for grabs and an ever-growing amount of assets to be managed. As a I will call you fintech, <laughs> but as a fintech vendor, um, you know, you're I'm sure fixated on how these players can scale their technology uh, to keep going, to keep up with the trends. There is just massive demand on infrastructure, on platforms, on access to markets, um, on custody uh, and on CRM. Um, do you build? Do you buy? Do you partner? Do you outsource? Thomas? Many thanks, Nick, for, for this question. I mean, what we have to, to see today, I mean, I mean, the whole fintech, I mean, the establishment of these fintech companies, I mean, I'm speaking now from mainly B2B providers, I mean, fintech companies who are selling their solutions and platforms to, to banks. I mean, they've, they, they really started, I mean, the first companies came up in 2013, 14, and they, and then since, since then, I mean, you have quite a high number of new companies coming into this game. But of course, it is not a shortcut to actually establish a very wide platform and cover all the needs of, of the clients and the banks, what they want to have. So many of these companies actually uh, taking uh, just niches uh, and, and, and actually covering this, this type of service. What it happened now as we speak, and we see that, that many fintechs, they come a little bit in, in, a, in a critical stage. They are, I mean, 50, 100, 200 people, and they really have to do the next level of growth. And, and what is happening, they actually go together, I mean, partnerships, joint ventures, uh, and even M&A transactions with, with other companies to complement their offering and, and, be, uh, and be, uh, being able to offer to their clients an end-to-end -end solution with all the important components. That is what I'm seeing of what's happening. There's many, there's not many fintech players which have actually a very bad platform which can cover all the needs and, and requirements of, of banks. And um, moving from fintechs to, to banks, Thomas, you know, the challenges for a bank today, you know, in, you know, basically systems, CRM, uh, wealth platforms built for a totally different generation, for a totally different product. I mean, how as a bank do you now cater for the, you know, your high net worth, your mass affluent and your retail, you know, and all the various different segments? And I'm, I'm going to throw this open because, I mean, is it pure robo that people are looking for? Uh, I would suggest possibly not, possibly some. But I mean, I, I think that the do humans, I mean, can I ask this a general question? Do humans, are humans at the point now where they actually trust a robo with fully with their money? Or do they need a hybrid type? Where are we today? Mark, okay. go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think, um, I think first of all, the debate the, was conclusive in the sense that it's, a, it's an end. You don't, as a customer, you no longer need to choose between one or the other. They want both. Uh, the convenience of technology, the, can, the pricing of uh, technology, the transparency of that, uh, but especially during uh, emotional difficult times like uh, February, March last year, uh, we were on webinars weekly, we were holding great webinars like this one, uh, we were on WhatsApp, on calls, so uh, I think on that one, whether you're a fintech or a bank, it's really, really key to be available on the contrary extend your 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 hours as opposed to shrink them and uh, reduce that i also think in terms of trust it's been completely it's changing whether you're a millennial or or not 
And by the way, millennials, I think there are some that are in their 40s now. So, so our image changed. Uh, but they all want the same thing. They want to, no one, everyone, we all want transparency. We all want to pay uh, lower fees. So the concept of trust comes, is no longer I'm old, so you should trust me. It's more, it's more about showing the value. So yeah, just, just to give you a bit about uh, like our experience on why we chose to be a hybrid versus choose one path or another. Deepak, um, you have obviously an existing client base, uh, which is obviously the characteristic of a bank and many different clients. How do you service them from a wealth perspective? Is it one product fits all or do you need different product segments? So uh, I think there are, there are different segments and, and you need different uh, offering. Um, so clearly you, one size does not fit all. Uh, so there are a couple of things in this. Uh, one is the element of advice and how we approach our clients and what is it that the client expects from us. Now, it, you know, as a, as a brick and mortar bank, uh, and if we don't go digital, there is a limitation to what we can deliver. Uh, also look at the client usage of branches. And that's another very interesting phenomenon that we are seeing very much in Dubai and it's already happened in many countries in Europe that uh, the number of branches uh, per millennia of population or per thousand or hundred thousand of population has been dropping. And now you can see that happening even in Dubai. So it, it, it's a clear sign that clients do not like to come to branches anymore. On any typical day, if I go down to my branch, I don't see high net worth or wealth clients over there. What I see is their drivers and their couriers and and their office boys coming to deposit checks or collect some documents. So, so I think the decision is done, like Mark said. Uh, it, is, it is moving towards digital, but it cannot be 100% digital. And I think that's where the advantage of advice comes. The hybrid model is what is required. Now, when we do our segmentation in the bank, because of a much larger customer base, we have a private banking offering, which is very one-on-one. -on -one. But, but again, over there, I see the population of private banking customers becoming younger with time because that wealth transfer has started happening. Millennials are already in their 40s. Yeah, that's what Mark just mentioned, and that's correct. So I see younger and younger customers, and they are least interested in coming and sitting down in our majlis or having the cup of coffee they, their fathers used to have with our branch managers. So it's changing. Then we have a very large base of mid-segment uh, wealthy, the, the affluent, uh, and, and of course, they are the ones who are working hard. They are in their salaried jobs or they are businessmen. They have no time to come to a bank. They want 100% digital. So the sooner we move there, the faster we capture and retain that business. And then, of course, you at the bottom, you have a very large base of mass affluent and the mass population uh, where it, was, it will never be um, financially viable for us to provide uh, 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 even a hybrid model or even, or, or an RM driven model. So that will, that will necessarily have to go 100% digital. Now, so, so this is how the segmentation works and this is how our product offering and delivery will pan out, uh, Nick. And, and, and as we just saw, I mean, each of these three segments will essentially be driven towards technology over a period of time. So even private banking, it, I see that as very much individual uh, person to person oriented banking, but elements of that will have to move to, to digital because these are the customers who are on the go. Uh, they don't have time to, to even sit down with their managers at all times. So, so elements of that will go digital, but it will stay hybrid uh, in, in the top two segments. Interesting. Guys, um, two, two subjects that I think come together um, the IFA the independent financial advisor and the transference of wealth and the new tight younger millennial Gen Y who's going to inherit this wealth. So obviously the IFA has played a major part in the gap between private banking and retail uh, traditionally. You know, if you have some wealth, but you don't qualify for private banking, 
you're going to have a good friend who's an IFA or you've had a good friend who's been an IFA and he uh, advises you. Obviously, we know that there's been a lot of pressure on this segment from regulators in terms of what, in fact, IFAs can do and how they get paid because it hasn't been particularly transparent, shall we see? You've also had and you're having younger customers now coming uh, who have new passive products. You know, Mark's Robo, for example, uh, um, ETFs, you know, um, high beta. Uh, there are, so, so what is going to happen in that space? You know, I wouldn't, I mean, I would suggest I wouldn't want to be an IFA right now, but tell me, what, what do you think, guys? And, and I'm reading that this tra huge transference of wealth to the next generation, you know, surveys are showing that over 70% will choose a different type of advisory service to their parents. I, I just wanted to uh, highlight a little uh, more on the numbers on the survey that Nick mentioned. Actually, the surveys are showing that 90% of heirs, when they inherit wealth, end up changing their advisor or wealth manager. And uh, the survey is also showing that 57% of the younger population will change uh, the, their advisor for technology. If, if given a choice, this is the Deloitte survey, which shows that 57% of the millennials will change their firm for technology. And uh, we, we, it, it also says that 65% of those will leave their advisor if the advisor does not offer digital services. So I think these are all just aligning to what you said, Nick. Uh, um, Mark, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I love this topic because the the role of the advisor or IFA has changed, I think. Uh, and I agree with you, Nick, I would not want to be an IFA or at least not the traditional role um, for the reasons that they've been associated, especially in the UAE with extremely high fees that are uh, sometimes eating away most of the returns uh, of their clients. Uh, so I think the, the era of com uh, like high commission, et cetera, is coming to an end. Um, the other data point about IFA is that's problematic is that uh, research has shown time and again that as humans, we're really not good at picking stocks. And uh, in fact, in 2019, the, the passive uh, volume has surpassed active. So that was quite an epic uh, milestone in, in the history of investing. That being said, I, uh, I really like the new role that the advisor is playing, uh, such as at Sarwa, where it's a lot about storytelling. It's a lot about education. Um, managing complexity when someone's wealth or their situation is unique, or even chat, like chatbots still really suck. We don't like to deal with with chatbots. We want someone like, and if there is a chatbot, the best feature we like is, you know, the part where we can talk to someone. So, so I'm, I don't think the, the role is disappearing in any way, but rather it's just changing to work more uh, for the customer and away from uh hopefully decision making around allocations sorry to interrupt Mark. would you say more customer centric it has to be more customer centric yeah. whether you're fintech yeah, or just, bank that's that's the key here right yeah exactly and just recognizing what are the areas where technology is better and what are the areas where we are better uh, but when it comes to discipline not being biased by emotions not not being prone to uh, herd behavior or or all of these you know, what we call the behavior gap that can lead to suboptimal returns for the customer, the advisors are just as biased sometimes as the customer. So using technology to remove that is a big opportunity. And But the role mm -hmm. of that the human can play to just be available and, and bridge the gap where most of us don't know how to invest when we start out or are not taught that at school. There, there's a quite a learning curve that the advisor fills in that no amount of videos sometimes uh, will do it justice, just depending on where that unique client situation is. Fantastic. Um, guys, just to, I've got some questions coming in. It, 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 so clearly we're, we're getting some sparks from our audience. Uh, um, before I go there, I just wanted to ask a, a question to Thomas. Um, with your experience of working uh, with um, an offshore bank, um, 
and this is a centric towards the region. You know, obviously this region has been a center of capital and it's been an exporter of capital. How do we stop that, Thomas? How does that capital come back? And, and obviously Deepak and Mark, you both will have opinions on this. Um, but I mean, at, at the end of the day, we have been an, an, um, an international bank haven for, for taking assets out of the region. Do you see that changing? Do you see it coming back? And what would have to happen for it to come back? Yeah, I mean, in Credit Suisse, I mean, um, speaking now of my, my past, we always have seen if political stability in a region or unsure or whatever unsafety was not 100% given. I mean, in from these countries, there was a trend that more money uh, actually leaving the country and, and is, is offshoring. But the second driver uh, is beside, beside all the security aspects. Uh, it is, of course, the, the services that they can get in the international banks. And quite frankly, I see there the big chances uh, when I look to the Middle East right now. So we have an increased uh, stability. So there is no need anymore to offshoring a big, uh, uh, big uh, wealth uh, as, as we speak. I mean, or at least you can put it this way, more money could stay here. So you have an, a rising middle class. So if you not lose this rising middle class now to offshore banks and you keep them here with a good service, I mean, they will grow here and will have more money here uh, than uh, people uh, with similar, uh, in similar wealth brackets had in, uh, in, in the Middle East. And uh, I mean, if you look at today, I mean, I know the numbers from all the, the bigger banks. I mean, how, are, how big are their, their Middle Eastern uh, desks uh, in Switzerland and, and UK and so on? I mean, you can assume that two thirds of the money is outside um, and it's not booked in, in the Middle East. Clearly, I mean, as a bank, you have to drive the strategy to repatriate money and of course, to avoid that new uh, people which have to get money that they're not moving out. And uh, politically, you cannot do well much on, on, um, as, as a bank, but what you can do, you can have actually a similar offering than these, uh, than these international banks are, are offering. And clearly the, the, the trend for digitalization is now a chance to actually increase and to be closer to these international banks in one step. I mean, because in many of these international banks, they're not very progressed, even with uh, digitalization solutions. I mean, online banking they have, but the end-to-end -end solution, especially when it comes to wealth management, is not idle with many banks as we speak. So that is actually a huge chance for the Middle Eastern banks to, yep. to jump on the train and, and service these, these, uh, these clients. Thank you, Thomas. Deepak, are you relishing? This are you licking your lips, thinking this is we have a right and we will win back this business onshore? I think we are already seeing that. Uh, so as uh, Thomas said, as the product gap reduces, and uh, and it's you know products are very democratic by nature. Technology is very democratic. So as we build our capabilities, we are seeing more and more more of that capital being retained here. We are also benefiting from policy changes. So inheritance laws that have uh, been changed here, um, you know, the, the applicability of your country's inheritance law, um, the applicability of, of wills and so on. So we are already seeing uh, benefits out of policy changes. We are already seeing benefits as we reduce this product gap. So as more technology firms develop and as more of us embrace technology, uh, I think we keep reducing this gap. So, so every fintech which is being set up in the UAE is helping to, to reduce that gap because that is creating more domestic uh, domiciled capabilities which did not exist so far. So I think everything that we are seeing right now uh, be it Sarwa setting up, uh, you know, a robo advisory or others like Sarwa or banks, large banks getting into robo advisory business, this gap continues to be reduced. 
So we are already seeing the benefit of that, uh, Nick. Excellent. Um, guys, I'm going to um, actually take a question that sort of fits in nicely right now, although it's before we were due to take audience questions. Um, so FinTech Bank, um, you know, I think a lot of people want to know what's the advantage of going to a FinTech? Is it price? Um, is it a lot cheaper to go to a robo through a FinTech than have a digital experience through a bank? Mark? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. <laughs> we don't have the real estate. Uh, we don't have all the things that, like it's not like banks are trying to make uh, money out of their customers, right? Like there, there's a lot of great ethical banks uh, such as CVD and, and many others. It's, it's more about the complexity of managing a real estate network, uh, a lot of people, very complex systems. So uh, we're lucky in a certain way to, to be super lean and to shift these savings to our customers. It's not really a rocket science or a formula. We launched in eight weeks with less than $20,000 spent. Uh, <laughs> like, I think that says a lot about uh, how lean it can be uh, to just launch. Now, what, all the work that comes after, it's not just about pricing, right? You, you don't want to just differentiate on that. It does matter in investing because ultimately combining pricing and a passive strategy is the ultimate combination to have really amazing returns. But it's about the whole experience. Like if you look at our reviews, no one is just saying Sarwa is more cost efficient. It's about how easy it was to open an account. Like we are, we get used to uh, tons of paper and going to the branch, et cetera. Like to have a refreshing experience where in five minutes I have an, an investment account that I opened uh, with a selfie or, uh, or doing everything online or talking on WhatsApp, like having a more human tone of voice. So it's just the combination of, of all of these things that we, we're trying to build on top of. Um, and I think the, the new point that's coming, the, the new trend we're seeing is product development. Um, you know, we're getting better, more confident at launching other verticals. Before it was all about, let's do one thing really well. I think the, the new trend we're seeing with other players too is to start tapping into saving, trading and many other areas that our customers are demanding. Thank you, Mark. Um, Deepak? Yeah, and I, would, I would just add to that, that yeah, banks traditionally have been very product driven, whereas fintechs have traditionally been seen as very customer driven because fintechs started their business with a customer need. Banks have customers and they start analyzing and you know, they, they are very product driven. They say, okay, I'm offering these five services. Can I offer six more services cross sell to my base? So the whole approach is very product driven. Now there are advantages and disadvantages. When you, when, when you are a small company, you can be very customer oriented because you're trying to solve one need, some problem, one problem. Uh, whereas banks are trying to, you know, stay profitable, uh, cross sell, uh, and therefore start thinking in terms of products. Um, but what is, what is helping the banks is that when fintechs uh, create that environment, they lead the banks to a tipping point where banks have to eventually evolve and align themselves with where the market is heading. So, so if we have 250,000 customers, uh, I can't stay product driven always and I can't just think about launching the next one. I have to, I have to do what the market is doing. And uh, so, like I said earlier, it's easier for us to do it because I don't need to go raising capital like a FinTech would have to do. Uh, we have excess capital uh, to invest in growth. Uh, I don't have to go looking for clients because we already have those clients. It's a question of how do I want to approach them through the brick and mortar or through new channels. Um, I don't have to go... Uh, reinventing the regulatory framework because we are already heavily regulated. So it's much easier for us to, to, to increase our outreach, new channels or, or increase product offering. So there are inherent benefits that we get. And uh, when it comes to 
uh, you know, fintechs, the role that fintechs are playing in our economy today is taking us and showing us the new way of doing business. And, and it's not without any reason that if you look at very large banks like Goldman Sachs in the US, they have launched new brands, which are completely digital brands. So they, they've launched a bank called Marcus. Now, Marcus is, is Goldman Sachs, but digital Goldman Sachs. Now, they know that there are uh, dozens of fintech companies in the US that are nibbling uh, at the edges of Goldman Sachs. Um, and, and the clients are getting, you know, the needs are very apparent, the millennials, the Gen Z and so on. So what's the option for a large bank? The option, option for the large bank is either we start reinventing, uh, repositioning, or we create a digital bank, which is much easier. So that's what Marcus has done uh, from Goldman Sachs. So if you look at other banks like, like Barclays or Morgan Stanley, um, uh, Deutsche Bank, Citibank, they've all launched their own brands of, of digital wealth solutions. They're not extending just the Citibank brand. They're, they're just, they're launching their robo advisories. So, so Deutsche Bank says it's, they call, they call it Max Blue. Uh, Morgan Stanley calls it Access. Um, Barclays calls, calls it Plan and Invest. And City has its own name called Wealth Builder. So now how did this happen? This didn't happen because Citibank thought that we should be a pioneer in robo advisory. No, in fact, there were numerous other pioneers in the US. But eventually, Citibank stepped into the game. And when Citibank steps into the game, they step into the game big time. Or Morgan Stanley gets into this business. They have access to millions of clients already. So, so, so the bottom line is, the fintechs will show us the way. Eventually, the large banks will have their benefit. And that's why I said in the beginning, the game is about marrying the two, but these native digital companies, which are fintechs, and the product-oriented companies with a lot of customers and capital. And this is the partnership which will define the future. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel, either of the two. So you're saying basically side by side, fintechs and banks. It's not one or the other. Yeah, or, or join hands. Join hands. Join hands. I yeah. mean, I just want to put a couple of points out there because there's so much to talk about in this subject and we've got limited time. So maybe putting, threading a few. Um, we've seen ETFs, you know, we've seen the success of ETFs. We've seen the reduction of fees, you know, in from brokerage to custody to, uh, you know, to uh, products. So there's, you know, and we've seen robos on the advisory side, obviously using tech, to scale and to you know, service as many customers as possible. So there is clearly pressure on fees. Um, so how do you operate in a regulated environment which has lots of fixed costs, technology costs? How do you offer portfolios and advice to Mrs. Miggins, all the way up to, you know, B2B, from $100 in the portfolio up to, you know, a million dollars. And how do you make money from that? Yeah. Uh, if I can jump in here, like, I, I really love just that segment that you called out, Nick, because to give you a data point, 60% of our customers are investing for the first time. So it's not, it's not like we are competing for it. We're creating this market that would have never, they would have never had that wealth discussion, uh, maybe never, or until their 40s or 50s or 60s, who knows, until they reach that, uh, that account minimum. So the first part is not just snatching, Findex aren't really snatching customers from back. This is an un untapped, underserved market. Um, but operating in a regulated environment, I think is really difficult for banks. When we moved to the UAE, um, that was one of the reasons that led us to go on our own is just realizing it's not going to take eight weeks to launch this if we have IT compliance risk, et cetera, in the same room and we need to a steering committee, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's difficult. Um, and as, as Deepak was saying, there's, there's opportunities and challenges. But just to go back on the example with Marcus and Goldman, 
um, to my knowledge, that was a bit of a flop when they launched and they acquired Clarity Money after as a fintech uh, because they were competing with them and they couldn't handle the, not couldn't handle the competition, but the, the build by partner shifted uh, after that. It's specifically from having to, to compete. So unfortunately, it was ended up in a, <laughs> in a buyout. That proves that proves your point, Deepak. On ultimately, you're right. You can sort of sit in the back seat and and react later. Um, I, I would. I don't know how long that can last, as some of these fintechs are just becoming giants as well. So I don't know how durable that is. I think we're still in the early days of it. That might shift later, where uh, especially we brought up. You brought up a great point, Deepak, around you know the tech giants that have much more of a DNA to uh to a startup than a bank so i think that's yeah. it's an interesting dynamic there's a lot of activity collaboration decision decisions to make um yeah mark if Hopefully i can just jump in mark yeah. deepak or thomas um so the, the the point i'm trying to get here is um or an, an, another point i'm trying to get is there's you know there's sort of a, a race to ground zero in terms of fees um mm -hmm. so is it going to become harder and harder uh, as a firm uh, unless you're adopting you have huge scale and obviously you'd need huge amount of tech to give you that scale mm, is, it, is this Sorry, the future is it, is it reducing costs or is it about the performance of you know uh, after fees against the benchmark and how you know, we're pa in a passive world today, mm -hmm. but that doesn't, all, you know, it's cyclical, as we know. You're not always in a passive world. You haven't always got the Fed and central banks pumping trillions in to make it a one-way trade, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And things can get difficult. And then, so is it, you know, to, to me, Mark, the, or Deepak and Thomas, you know, Where's Utopia here for a firm in the financial services? Is it trying to reduce cost or is it trying to provide real value and performance? What we clearly, what has to be found is new pricing models. I mean, if you see now a Charles Schwab and, and so on, I mean, and, and some other players offering a zero brokerage, I mean, uh, custody nearly for free. So that is the trend which is coming. And, and I remember at my time in, in, in Credit Suisse, that was challenging like, like hell. I mean, uh, I had to renegotiate the fees with the clients on a, on a half yearly basis. And we always got a little bit lower, hmm? especially the bigger the clients, the more, uh, the more demanding. So, I mean, new pricing models. I mean, it could be, for example, I mean, it could be a performance related fees or if a client really asks for services that you actually start charging like a lawyer huh, on an hourly basis. I mean, new models came in, into the picture because it was not sustainable anymore. Um, if you have very low transaction fee that you just do a lot of stuff for the client uh, for free. And clients are starting to accept that uh, slowly, but, uh, but, but surely. And then one thing we have to understand, I mean, uh, the Charles Schwab and all that, they, they cross-finance a lot. Huh? I mean, they uh, it, sometimes they're offering something for free to do the, the money on, uh, on, on a different side. But that is a tricky model on the long run, huh? because if this other one is weakening from a profitability view, you're, you're here with, with nothing. Hmm? So, so if you allow me, uh, Nick, I think Please. The, the, I think the point has already been made in our industry, in the wealth management industry, when you have ETFs, and, and I think Mark mentioned that passive investing overtook um, uh, the, the active investing uh, sometime, sometimes in, in 2019. So it, the disintermediation is already happening. Uh, people want direct access. Uh, so that's how ETFs evolved, uh, and and uh, and that is how the the active managers are losing out. So where active managers were making two percent per annum to run a mutual fund, you get ETFs which are at twenty basis points or ten basis points per annum. So that level of destruction of fees has already happened uh, because the industry is moving in that trend. Another point you made is about the IFAs. 
the disintermediation of IFAs is a given uh, in this industry. Uh, w when very smart fund managers cannot get away by charging 2% anymore, how can um, a job lock IFA advisor uh, get away by charging 2% per annum as advisory fees or make huge upfront revenue on selling some products that are built in fees and so on. So I think those days of intermediaries making a lot of money are already behind us. Now the question is going forward, what level of cost base can you sustain when the overall profitability of this business is going to become thinner and thinner with time? And how would you gather those assets that will then make you profitable? And eventually, eventually, which we are seeing some bit of that already happening in Singapore, even the robo advisory businesses will need to consolidate. And that would be probably the first stage of, of gathering uh, critical assets. And for me, the final stage is when these robo advisors and banks merge or, or robo advisors uh, get taken over by large financial institutions. Again, not for the reason uh, that, that uh, Goldman Sachs couldn't set up uh, an advise, uh, a, a robo advisory, but for more for the reasons of managing your costs and remaining profitable and getting those those uh, critical AUMs. So I think the industry is moving in that sort of a direction where you will have bigger and bigger players. By the way, this is happening in every industry. The big are getting bigger. The Amazons are the Amazons of the world are taking away the mom and pop shops. So. It's the same thing which is going to happen in the wealth management industry as the margins continue to compress and the requirement for volumes continues to increase. Uh, Deepak, I happen to completely agree with you um, that there is going to have to be consolidation uh, in order to achieve the scale needed in this yes. industry. Um, and, and that's really no different to other industries that we're seeing where tech yeah. is having a major impact. So nothing, nothing surprising there. Um, and, um, you know, to continue be able to add value to clients, you are going to need a large um, amount of tech and scale. So one thing goes to another, you know, whether it's ultimately uh, a big fintech consolidation or whether it's fintech and bank consolidation, that remains to be seen. Um, or, or, or if big tech steps in. Or big tech, yes. Yeah, what if Amazon and Apple decide and Google yes. decide to get into wealth management? Yeah. Look, they, they are as trusted as big banks. So, yeah. so, so what happens then? So I think there is, there is a lot of but disruption coming. I yeah. liked what you said. Ultimately, fintechs have driven the industry yes. Yes. to this place and now uh they they have steered the ship and now financial institutions need and are waking up to the fact that they're either out of the game completely or they have a play in this and, and i think it i mean i would like to say it is as simple as that for financial institutions they are not going to be around if they do not address this need this customer centric changing dynamic of the customer has to be addressed thomas sorry you were yeah no look i mean just i mean with technology you can reduce your marginal costs i mean that is principally the only thing you can do you can optimize the whole servicing of smaller clients retail clients as automated as possible as as as, as, yeah, I mean, a full self-service uh, journey, which is, of course, user-friendly and client-friendly. But if you if you can actually have a very good offering there uh, for, for these clients, they, they take it. And, and, I mean, the marginal cost on a technology platform per client is very, very small. Huh? So, I mean, actually, that, that could... That could I mean, release a little bit the pressure on uh, on the cost, but you have to do it. And only when the segments are getting higher, you actually start introducing hybrid services and, and other stuff. Um, but that could be one journey just with the product selection and the client size, you're offering different services and start offering 
I mean, actually, services which has a hybrid element, but that will be the trend. Or clients are ready to pay for certain services in another way. I mean, uh, no way around. Gents, I've got one last question myself, and then I've got to go because we are literally being flooded with questions from the audience. And I'm, I, know, I know that I could go on with you guys till next Wednesday, quite frankly, on this subject. Um, so um, I'm just uh, deciding whether I should go to, to questions now from the audience. Um, so why don't, why don't we do that? Um, so um, this is to Deepak from Subra Prakash, Deb. Uh, to Deepak, what are the regulatory support required to catalyze this technology trend and adopt at a bank level? So I guess it's focusing on, um, you know, do you need changes in regulation yeah, to be I able to maximize your use? in this space yeah. of technology? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, the, the regulators play a very important role right now in the wealth management industry. There is no doubt in that. Um, now, it's the regulatory environment which has allowed the fintech space to open up. Uh, at the same time, the regulatory environment for large banks is still not as easy as it is for fintechs. Uh, it's not just a deployment of technology, but it begins with uh, all the other regulatory frameworks that we have to comply with. And that is onerous. And that is there for a reason, for the very right reason. But that does create a drag on, on banks becoming as nimble and as uh, quick uh, as fintechs are. So I think that regulatory arbitrage which may exist between the fintechs and the banks at some stage will have to be plugged as well. And I think that's where the regulators will have to play a more active role. Now, having said that, nothing stops us today from a regulatory perspective to, to offer any technology solution, nothing at all. Uh, it's just that the process that we follow is a little different from the process a fintech would follow. And therefore it's very easy for large banks uh, who, who would like to move into to the digital space, probably at the same speed uh, if they want to and if they can overcome their internal bureaucracies and processes and think like native digital, the way fintechs think, and nothing stops us from a regulatory environment, Nick. Um, and Deepak, uh, Mark, I mean, it's, it's clear to me here in the GCC that at these countries, these governments, and these regulators are super keen to get involved with fintech. I mean, the, um, the hubs they're creating, the incentives they're creating, the sandbox regulation they're creating. I mean, that is probably a concern to banks because as a fintech, you're, you're given right now real incentives and advantages to operate. But I, Mark, I'd love your opinion, but I, I kind of agree, Deepak, as these fintechs grow, they will have to, you would think there would have to be uh, a, a similar level of regulation. Mark? Yeah, no, I totally agree, Nick. They're, they're awesome. Like whether it's in, uh, in any city, whether Dubai or Abu Dhabi, they've just been really good at uh, listening to, uh, to our point of view, the pain points that we have, what we want to change in the policies uh, that don't work and just find, figuring out solutions. So they've been uh, really amazing. And sometimes... We position the regulator as uh, like slow or, or conservative, but and I was really impressed with how they're ultimately they care about protecting the consumer. As long as that's the vision in mind, they've been really good. The challenge has rather been that there's three of them. That sort of adds <laughs> that adds complexity yeah. in the yeah. UAE. But besides that, like individually, et cetera, like and they're figuring out the communication lines. But there's definitely a big push. Um, and you're seeing a lot more like licenses being announced and startups, uh, fintechs. Before it was like a PR. Yeah. I remember when we got licensed for the first time, there was a big press release. Today, it's just been a, it's it's a process that's being uh, uh, well, like hopefully monthly, at maybe weekly one day. Not not to to play to you, but uh, I think that you've been a real um, inspirational firm in this space in the Middle East. No question. Um, you. you know, you. as the first. 
and I'm sure there will be many following. Uh, okay, so let me try and chug through some of these messages. I, I see a really interesting one here. Do you see changes coming out from the GameStop situation? Inexperienced investors, I think this plays to robo, to be honest. Uh, inexperienced investors investing into momentum and using leverage options to exponentially increase risk and return. Do you see greater regulation and concern about filters for clients based on sophistication, wealth, et cetera? So, I mean, that, that is massively playing into the advisory space, I think. Guys, yeah. any, any comments apart from? Yeah, like we, we've had the comment on it, like on, on, on my end, I would say, um, and there's nothing, there's, there's a few things that are unique. It's a cool story. Uh, However, like in the grand scheme of things, I don't think there's anything new. I put it in the speculative bucket as opposed to uh, having profound imp implications on um, a, a well-diversified long-term plan and, and, and all the great things backing wealth management. Um, so yeah, we've had to comment on it, but I think one thing that it does highlight, however, is the, the importance of whether you're a bank or a fintech to just get greater visibility across all areas of the customer's activity so that, and, and, you know, if we're dreaming 10 years down the road, just not play, not as a wealth manager, I don't just understand what the customer is doing uh, with us or in their portfolio, but the activity, the behavior, uh, whether it, whether they're spending their speculative um, urges or, or whatever we call it. So I'm going on a tangent, but in, in a nutshell, I don't see it as a major um, impact on the wealth industry at this stage. I think from a, from, yeah. from a regulator, sorry, if I may just add to that, Please. from a regulator's perspective, and I think we see that happening now in our, in our markets, the regulators are becoming very active on that. This, the, the, probably the missing link because of which such things happens is customer education. And, and this is a role which the regulators are now playing increasingly in, in many markets. So yes, regulators started with ensuring uh, uh, certifications and standards for the advisors, uh, but that is not enough. Uh, they, they have to step to the next level and get into the customer education piece. And we need to spend collectively, all, all of us have equal responsibility of, of educating customers. Uh, and I think beginning of the call, uh, beginning of this uh, discussion, Mark said that we are not taught wealth management in schools. Whereas all our life, we work on earning money, but no one teaches us how to manage our money. Uh, and I think that's the regulatory space and, and, and the regulators need to play a bigger role through uh, players like us. And, and that is a very imminent uh, call, uh, I guess, for customer education. Excellent. Um, yeah, very well put. Guys, how is it possible to open a robo advisory and be licensed in eight weeks without risk and compliance, etc.? <laughs> that's a question that's a coming. Of, interesting. A lot of work. I don't. I don't recommend it. It's a lot of work. <laughs> but ultimately, it's just. It's it's sort of what Deepak was mentioning about the DNA of of um, or names such as digital native and all of that. It's just deciding what is the minimal viable experience we want to launch with. Of course, security, custody. Um, and the big risks need to be uh, addressed, but uh, like I won't lie, when we launched, it took it took uh, maybe 28 minutes to open an account with Sarwa. I'm not saying it wasn't perfect on day one, but at least we were able to help someone with a few thousand dollars. Uh, get That's a amazing. Managed portfolio. That's amazing. So, 28 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Well, um, I... so yeah, as a starting point. For as sure, a starting I, point, I, yeah. Yeah, if it, just the answer is just you're really asking yourself uh, what is the minimum to have when we launch and really removing the noise um, to focus a lot of these after that, like autom the automation that uh, Thomas was talking about uh, for costs. These, these are things that came a lot later. We weren't as focused on costs on day one as, uh, you know, year two and year three and, and today. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. How are, similar, how are smaller fintech companies going to compete with the bigger fintech entities such as Stashaway? Isn't it too late for them? Along with, what is Commercial Bank of Dubai's ambition as it pertains to wealth services? And how do you see yourself compete with the new evolving models? So we've got one fintech and one bank. I think 
okay to combine. Yeah, so, so as a bank, we are, we are uh, going to get into this space sooner than later. Th yeah. That's given, yep. and, and there is no denying. If, if banks don't get into this space, they'll be left behind. We are very happy that the fintechs have guided us to, the, to where the industry is today. As I said earlier, we are at a tipping point where if we don't play that game, we'll be left behind. So as Commercial Bank of Dubai, we will be playing that game very soon. We will be in that game. Uh, uh, can I just add to that? Sorry, Mark, and then have a go on the fintech side because uh, an, another um, listener, uh, Dina Medic, has said one aspect that has not been stressed enough is the wealth of data insights that banks can utilize when offering wealth management advice. This is one of the advantages retail banks can use versus fintech. How are you utilizing that, Deepak? Yeah, well, that is the starting point because we have... We have, like I said, 200, 300,000 customers. It's, it's very easy for us to analyze, segment, create clear messages for different segments and approach them with, with, with targeted offerings. Uh, so, so that is one of the key advantages. And I would like to thank uh, your, your uh, listener who just highlighted this. This is one of the other advantages we have, apart from the customer base and the capital. Uh, we also have great insights. So, so if you just look at our credit card base, the thousands and thousands of credit card customers, we have such great insights into their spending patterns. Uh, and that can be very easily linked now to their savings patterns. Uh, it's a great starting point. Uh, of our customers, we today have um, about 40% of our customers who are interacting with us only digitally. So it's so easy for now for me to now cross sell to them other digital offerings. So so we don't we don't need to go looking for new customers. So yes, there are great inherent advantages that we can tap into very easily. Quality of data, Mark. So how yeah. does a startup fintech compete with bigger? I mean, presumably different value proposition, more innovation. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack, but I would say um, knowing ultimately it's all about knowing the customer and the and the and the journey. Like for us, one thing we were really adamant on is building a brand finally specifically focused for the the UAE, without necessarily being forced to offer local products, but offer the best products without any bias towards one or the other. So the fact that we're independent, uh, the fact that we are are from here, we know the region, we're committed to it. Uh, and our focus on it allows us to just differentiate to a whole other level. Um, I think the argument of like, we're big, uh, <laughs> like we're big, therefore we're better um, is long gone. I think VCs, we haven't talked about them as a player, but they're coming in big um, with FinTech, backing your local FinTechs uh, in the region. So, uh, and they have a big role to play because uh, you finally solve the puzzle between capital, the right client, uh, base, the, the right client experience. So putting all of that together can be very powerful. But of course, like I think ultimately it's not one or the other as we were highlighting. It's there's a lot of work to, <laughs> there's a lot of work and education uh, and segments to be done and different versions of it. So uh, I think it's, it's great for the consumer to have, uh, to finally have proper wealth management. I think it's a win-win. Everyone benefits everyone benefits from this the customer and the intermediaries guys um we have well and truly overrun our time and, and unfortunately because i would like to continue this you know but uh, at the end of the day we have a time allotment um it's been really fabulous uh, amazing insights on a a, a a truly innovative topic um i think it's probably the most exciting place at the moment within the financial industry is the the um the changing uh you know the tech involvement in wealth management the where this ends up uh who knows uh, but we know we're going on a journey and i hope our audience has enjoyed it i certainly have and i'd like to thank you all for being involved and also being truly innovators yourselves and pass back to zach 
Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you, everyone who's joined this session. It has, we've highlighted what the industry is going to be looking like in over the next decade as things progress. The fintech space has certainly been a tremendous disruptor, and we really think that we're just in the early innings of how this is going to make the financial industry more accessible, uh, more fair, more efficient for everyone. Um, again, I, I cannot thank all the participants that dialed in today uh, enough. Um, be sure to join us in our next AIM Summit webinar next Wednesday, the 17th of February at 5 p.m. Gulf Standard Time. We're going to be discussing the role of digital assets in the post-pandemic world. Uh, we have uh, Saeed Aldarmaki from Alphabet. Uh, we have Avanish Aquila, uh, Chief Investment Officer of Arano Capital. And we have uh, Rishi uh, Ramchandani from BlockFi. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, please like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel now, and be sure to sign up at aimsummit.com so you can be part of live sessions and uh, this excellent Q&A uh, as you saw today, which uh, has been extremely interactive and, and thought provoking. Thank you all so much.